Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Helen Garneau. Um, I do marketing here at Indicio. Um, we are very excited that you could all join us today, and we are very excited that we have the opportunity to do these events. This is part of Indicio's public benefit mission uh, to help increase awareness, education, understanding of decentralized identity, verifiable credentials, and all things associated with identity, <laughs> digital identity. So we're really glad that um, you can be here. And if you have any other questions about Indicio or um, our company um, or our products, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. James Schulte is actually the guy you'd want to talk to. So feel free to reach out to James on any of the platforms. Um, he's around. <laughs> Um, I am sitting here in beautiful, sunny Seattle today. Um, please feel free to drop a note in the chat where you are. Say hello, introduce yourself. Um, this is an opportunity for us to make community network, talk to one another. Um, this is a, a Zoom meeting, not a webinar per se. So this gives us the opportunity to use that chat, interact with one another. We'll have the opportunity at the end uh, to pop off um, uh, mute and turn on your camera if you'd like, if you feel comfortable and ask questions. Um, again, we, we would love that kind of cross community interaction um, on this um, uh, at this event. Uh, but with that said, if you're not asking a question and you're not <laughs> part of the part of the conversation, please uh, keep your uh, yourself on mute and keep your camera off um, just for distraction's sake. Um, we are recording this event and we will have it up on YouTube later. So if you have a friend or a colleague who you think would benefit from it or would be interested in it, you can uh, share it. We'll be putting it out to the meetup group so it'll pop up in your email um, uh, along with on uh, on Indicio's uh, YouTube. So look out for that a bit later. Um, with that, you know, again, like I said, this is about networking and conversation and things like that. Um, so as long as everyone's cordial and professional with one another, we shouldn't have any problems in terms of uh, rule discussion rules. Um, but with that said, we're really excited for today's conversation. Uh, we have four folks uh, from around Indicio with four different perspectives on the technology and the community and how our um, our world is evolving in terms of decentralized identity and verifiable credentials. So uh, with that, I will hand it off to Trevor Butterworth, who's going to act as moderator for today's conversation. Um, and I will go uh, turn my camera off here and uh, you can take it away, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so the, uh, the, the there are sort of two themes to the, today's conversation. It's, uh, um, you know, decentralized identity is taking over the world, but also what are the myths? What are the uh, what's true? What's plausible? What's uh, busted? Um, so we're, that's the framework that we're going to look at things uh, through. Um, but uh, to get things started, um, you know, it's conference season. Uh, we've all been on the road. Uh, it's a time to uh, see the state of the decentralized identity field against the background of digital identity uh, and to uh, to sort of, uh, you know, take stock of where we are and where we might be going. So. Uh, it, let's kick this off with some broad reactions to our, our various journeys over uh, the past few weeks. Um, James, I'm going to you're the you're the most the series the 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 most traveled. What, what are your what what have you taken away from uh, on on the state of things? Yeah, great question. And good morning, everyone from rainy Ann Arbor, Michigan. So if my power goes out, it's because of the lightning storm outside. So uh, hopefully my connectivity is good. But yeah, so the past couple of weeks going from uh, various conferences, what really stuck out to me was how much and how center stage decentralized identity was this year as opposed to, to previous years, um, especially due to the conferences being in Europe and in light of uh, yeah, this 2.0 um, legislation passed by the European Commission and the uh, recently emerged uh, architectural reference framework from the EU for the, the European Union digital identity wallet. It's obviously a, a huge topic, which was really exciting. There were a lot more um, players talking about advances that they'd been seeing, um, different areas where they're seeing adoption. Um, so definitely a, a main and central theme um, at, at several of these conferences. So, so that was exciting. Um, that being said, there's definitely some, um, I don't, I don't want to say necessarily myths, but yeah, I guess myths uh, that are still pervasive that I think would be good for us to, to talk about today. But overall, uh, generally, uh, really positive and exciting 
um, uh, atmosphere for for verifiable credential technology. Sam, what 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 have you taken away from your recent trip? Uh, everything <clears throat> everything that James said. The other thing that I'll, I'll mention is that because of the attention, we're seeing a huge influx of new people who uh, are now paying attention or are newly aware of the technologies and the things that are that are going on. What decentralized identity is, and so um, there's. Uh, whenever there's a new influx of people, there's uh, a sort of an uneven um, level of education about different concepts, technologies, approaches, et cetera, that happens. And so that's good because we often bring you know new insights into the into the area. Um, but sometimes you end up sort of rehashing or uh, or sort of reteaching uh, existing things. That's also good because it helps people to kind of come up to speed with with what's going on. Um, but that's in that that's just a sign of how much adoption there is and how much focus and attention there is. And so, um, you know, as we are in conversations in community meetings or, or everything else, the, the reminder to me is to not assume that everyone is on the same playing field or has been doing this the same time that sort of the previous core group was because there's there's new people to learn and there's and there's a lot of them and it's not going to stop. I think we're going to um, I think over the next year in particular, there's going to be a, a sort of a continuing surge of folks that are new to the space um, that uh, that um, that, you know, we need to help educate and share what would what we've accomplished and and where we are so that they're aware of that. So it's it's kind of exciting, but also frustrating because we're back to first principles in a way. Uh, yet we move, we're, we're further ahead than we ever have been. Yeah, both of those are true. Yeah, uh, Heather, uh, your take on the state of the field? Like Sam said, like you say, there's a group that's brand new to this. There are those that have been around the block in this technology for years. And it's really important for those of us who've been doing this for some time to actually start um, evening up our perspectives. And what I mean is we talk about this and sometimes in very dated ways that have not actually caught up to where the technology is. And so we're still speaking in dated language, dated paradigms, dated messaging. And the fact is, companies are actually using the technology now in production, but there's a whole contingent that talks as if it's not being used in production. And I think that's just um, because we've been talking that way for so many years, we need to actually have our language messaging and paradigm shift to where the technology is today, not where it was a year ago or five years ago. And we need to make sure that our messaging approach to market and solving customer problems match where the, the technology and customers are using it. And so that's part of it is bringing those two sides together. Uh, it's an interesting point. I was struck by in some of the sessions that I saw on discussing digital wallets, um, somebody said, actually, you know, digital wallets aren't that important. It's the use cases and the credentials. And then we, we, saw, we saw lots of examples of, of people that were just getting on and doing things uh, right. with the technology and solving, solving problems. Right. And I think to pick up on that, it's because we really need to focus in on the problem solving. We've spent so many years focused on how do we make this technology work? It works. Done. We're good. We need to focus on customers, organizations, governments, entities, universities, you name it. We need to focus on their problems and focus on how we're making their lives better, delivering value, creating more efficiencies. That's where we need to be talking about, not necessarily drilling into the wallets, but how is that wallet going to improve that company or the experience for that company's customers? That's where the conversation is, and that's where we need to be having a dialogue amongst each other instead of just focusing on all the components and parts and pieces and whether they work or that there's something coming down the road and so we all need to wait for it. That story's done, dated, and we're moving on. And those in the space who can talk to the business problems and solving them are the ones that are driving things forward. So uh, we, Trevor, we really, to yeah, in. go ahead, James, jump in. This is a conversation. Yeah, go yeah, for Heather, it. Heather had a really good point there. It, you know, talking with some of the other, uh, some of the vendors and some of the, um, 
vendors who you know focus more on the centralized identity access management platforms, I guess what you could call traditional identity uh, platforms, they, they seem to be in kind of a holding pattern, waiting until 2026, 2027 for when the European Union digital wallet is, is um, you know, widespread or has reached a certain level of maturity before they jump in. Um, or they're just waiting to see what others are moving to do um, so that it's kind of, yeah, like this holding pattern. And, you know, what I've seen on the business side is the customers that we have that we work with um, who are seeing immediate need immediate problems to be solved, immediate money to be made. Uh, that's, I think those are the players that will ultimately win in the space, addressing the value, uh, addressing the, uh, the bottlenecks that, that exist currently. Um, so there's no need to wait, the technology exists. Um, there are standards that are that are under development and that are being solidified over time, um, but there's there's really no need to to wait for, for others to get going. Right, so, because, because customers are winning right now. But here's the thing is, you can solve problems in your organization that don't need the European Digital Identity Wallet. And you may need that when it comes online, when the specifications more hammered out, but there are so many things you can do today without it. And it's really interesting to see companies and customers realize they can solve a myriad of internal problems using this technology without needing um, the specifications that are still being figured out, sorted out, discussed, and they're, they're making significant process, progress and significant gains. And that's what's interesting is thinking about this technology to solve internal or, or problems with a limited number of partners where the government regulation doesn't necessarily <laughs> impact your, your problem. So I, I want to come back to UD and IDIS in a moment. Oh, but... Trevor? Yeah. Uh, looks like Roy has a, uh, Roy is off mute and would, uh, has a question. Please. And but before you say anything, Roy, I just want to extend uh, uh, that opportunity either to uh, anybody can interrupt with a question at any time or they can post a question in the chat and we'll be happy to take uh, to answer them. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my question really is about... Um, the sort of practical, the ability to scale. And I'm wondering what you're hearing from uh, clients, customers about, uh, you know, I know, I think our solution uses uh, the Hyperledger Aries uh, underlying uh, technology. And, and I know it's been criticized in the past for being slow. Um, I just watched the demonstration. Um, I can't remember who gave it. Maybe it was you, James, <laughs> on the medical hospital uh, 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 use case that <clears throat> that you have, where people, you know, where doctors and uh, different technicians can sign can sign in and. And and even in the demo, you know, it took about 15 seconds for that uh, credential to to uh, resolve and 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 be done. And I know 15 seconds does doesn't seem like a you know it seems a lot better than you know messing around for a minute or two. But I'm just so my question is: Are you hearing are you hearing reluctance to engage? because people are afraid that they can't scale it or they or that uh, something new is going to come along and they can't connect to it um i i, I so i, I can give a, a an interesting answer on the speed thing so one of the presentations at uh european identity and cloud conference that really impressed me was an example of verifiable credentials being used in construction sites in order to um, manage the plethora of certifications that workers have to bring and you know, in order to work on the site, in order to get permission to work on the site. Um, and you think, oh, surely that can't be a critical use case. Um, uh, but in fact, the, you know, they were able to do in 10 seconds what it took normally 10 minutes to do um, every six weeks, every time they changed uh, a site. And, you know, you know, again, construction and, and the reaction was the construction workers said, this is great. This is such a headache that has been alleviated by simply, you know, doing a simple credential presentation. 
Um, uh, and what the, this I forget the name of the group that were doing this, but what they found was that they were rapidly, they were adding new companies every week because this small use case um, made a tangible difference to uh, to to uh, you know c construction workers and solved uh, you know s solved a really a, a pain a bottleneck uh, that people dreaded so um, so I don't you know speed is something I I'll let Sam maybe talk about the state of speed um, but um, I, I was uh, I was impressed by not, you know the, the ordinariness of the use cases that were coming around. Yeah, the speed's a good question, Roy. The um, and speed and scale are often often intertwined, and sometimes in ways they shouldn't. Um, so, uh, so Indicio Proven, uh, which is our product, um, uses a variety of ledgers and a, and a variety of tech, you know credential types and technologies across the gate. And so, some of them have more privacy features. The computation time takes a little bit uh, a little longer, but that's not, largely not what you're seeing um, when you go through a demo and you're seeing the whole process sort of front to back and everything happen, you're seeing a false scenario that's almost never going to happen in real life. Um, and to, to lean on Trevor's example, um, you know, they receive those credentials and they're not typically immediately asked to then go present those credentials. Um, that's you do that in a demo. In real life, they're going to go back to work. And then when the, you know, when an auditor comes around, then there's a process where that actually happens. And so the, the, the things that you see right now are not indicative of like what real life experiences will be like. Um, and so the other thing is, is that um, the speed of an individual transaction doesn't have an impact on the overall scale of a system in the sense that um, that uh, you can all of those things can be hap happening simultaneously and they're not in some big queue where they can only process one thing at a time because the architecture is decentralized by nature. So the fact that I'm very verifying a credential has no bearing on the speed of Trevor verifying a credential or, or any other company. Um, which means that all of those things happen massively in parallel, um, which gives us the type of scale we actually need. Um, and so that's important is that the system architecturally in, in, on purpose does not have everything to um, to come through, uh, you know, in the same in the same exact, uh, you know, queue or the same exact process. And because this isn't some centralized platform where everything, you know, sort of has to share those resources to make it happen. Does anybody else want to address that question or? Oh, let's, I'll move on then. So I do want to come back to Yudi and Idis, um, but um, one of the areas that, you know, we see rapid adoption and growth is travel. And yet um, we heard, we've heard recently that the infrastructure simply isn't there yet. Uh, to enable digital credentials for travel, verifiable credentials for travel, otherwise known as digital travel credential. Um, that doesn't seem to me to be true, but as, uh, what, what thoughts do you have on that? Who wants to step in on that? I'll step in and bust that myth. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the infrastructure is there, everything, uh, entity in travel in the entire travel ribbon whether that be air hospitality rail crews tour operators rental car you name it the infrastructure is there the thing you have to look at is that you can create ecosystems within your company within a small group of partners and grow those out to make them more global. So sometimes when I think people say, oh, the infrastructure's there, not there, it means that there's not one global entity running some kind of infrastructure, but you don't need that as long as you're, you're following open protocols, following the open standards and making sure that you're taking a flexible approach so you can adopt with where your partners and market is going. So absolutely the infrastructure is there today and the digital travel credential DTC type one is available to be fully deployed with infrastructure behind it to support everyone that wants to use it. And Trevor, I just want to add to that. So uh, this idea of needing a, a greater global ecosystem to plug into in order to get started, I think that's also a myth. Um, I think one of the, the most popular use cases or 
formats we're seeing are actually beginning with closed ecosystems where an issuer of credentials is also the verifier of its own credentials with its own given set of customers. And then they bring on another, another partner as an issuer uh, from whom they accept credentials or another verifier within their you know, partnership network. Um, so that's an area where they can they can immediately derive value within an organization by reducing friction, creating um, efficiency. So there's there's ways to ways to get started. Once you see a verifiable credential as a as a way of securely packaging information um, that can be reusable um, as well as as transportable even within your own organization's um, disparate you know databases or systems, um, then you realize that there are there are cost savings to be made right off the bat. Um, so when it comes to infrastructure, it really depends on your own company's internal infrastructure. And most companies have what they need to to be an issuer and verifier of their own credentials. James, you, so, you brought up something that I want <clears throat> to draw out a little bit, is that we often theorize about these massive verifiable credential ecosystems with with just incredible amounts of, of value and lots of participants and everything else. And that's not untrue, but we lose in that vision the immediate benefits of using verifiable credentials, even in a much smaller ecosystem. And so I, that's important because I think a lot of people are you lose the immediate application right in front of them that adds value for the potential coming down the, you know, to coming down the road. The, uh, the ironic piece is, is you're not going to be ready to take advantage of the potential coming down the road without actually engaging in the more immediate applications of the technology now. And so it's, I think it's important to not get lost in the future of how this is going to come out in, in such a way that distracts you from the actual immediate actions that are available. A hundred percent. We see the customers that are getting out in front are doing their own deployments and they're not hooking their future on large global organization partnership type organizations. They're getting in there and they're doing the hard work now. Um, and that's really important because I think there is a myth that you have to be part of a, a larger global partnership organization in order to succeed or make money in this or create efficiencies or cost savings. Absolutely not true. The most important thing you can do is deploy today and not sit and wait on saying, okay, I'm going to put my future in other organizations' hands and I'm going to sit and wait. And when this happens, which is a year, two, three years down the road, then I'll receive immediate benefit. That appears to be an easy button. It is not. And um, it's really important for organizations to build and solve their own problems in ways that work for them now with the infrastructure they have, rather than saying, well, I'm going to let someone else you know, be in charge of my destiny. And then when that happens, all of a sudden I'll be wildly successful. That's not how it's been working. So you can continue to be involved in those groups, but that is not your future. Your future is doing the hard work in your organization and deploying now, rather than saying someone else is just gonna take care of it for me. Well, that seems, so to, that that's a, a good- uh, Trevor? Uh, yeah. Can I jump in? It looks like Michael is off uh, camera or has turned his camera on. Michael, do you have a, uh, a question? Hi, it's been a while since we, we spoke. I'm involved in building some of the ecosystems in the uh, Middle East. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, based on what you just, just said, you know, what are the immediate use cases that you see can start bringing benefits without waiting for, you know, the global travel credential standards and so on in those formats? Um, well, we are seeing deployments, the ICAO digital travel credential type one, but we, we've talked about that and that's bringing immediate benefit where it's reducing border crossing by significant amount of time and easing customer experience. We see customers deploying in financial services creating account or know your customer credentials to share customer information inside of siloed legacy systems within their own multinational global company because they not necessarily communicate between all the entities. And we're also seeing um, areas in education 
and open badges and I'll turn it to James or Sam to pick up from there. Um, agriculture and supply chain is another huge one um, where there's information that needs to be passed along in a trusted way. And I want to highlight um, in, in case folks aren't, you know, haven't realized the core piece of this. Verifiable credentials is not a, a one new thing. It's not like, well, we're all going to do this one new thing over here. It's a, it's a, it's a different paradigm of passing trusted data. Um, in, in previous to verifiable credentials, you could really only trust data that came from the source that you retrieved directly, typically via an API, from the source of that information, and you knew because of where you got it that you could trust it. Verifiable credentials introduce an entirely new method of being able to trust the data you have, just even though you didn't get it directly from the, the, the issuer, as we would say, or the originator of the information, because you can check the signature and make sure that it has not been tampered with. And, and that gives you this, this ability to make trusted data portable. And that is incredibly useful in scenarios that don't have you know, one database to rule them all. There's lots of ecosystem verticals, for example, where information needs to be passed in a trusted manner from party to party. And the only previous ways they, they've been able to do it uh, involve, um, in, involve large infrastructure projects with big centralized databases and APIs and, and, and lots of really expensive integration. And a verifiable credential allows me to receive a credential, often from the subject of the credential themselves, evaluate it and trust it based on the issuer of the credential and the cryptographic verification that, that is involved. And, and that is incredibly powerful. It sounds simple when you just identify that one feature that it provides. And so um, the travel, of course, is a really good example because you're, you're going from one country to another country. You're crossing a border. They need to verify some information. And we're not going to get all the countries of the world to use all the same database to make this happen. That's, that's not only really, really expensive, but really logistically and legislatively complicated. But the ability for one country to, uh, to have some trusted information from the other, is, is, it's, and it's not a new concept. We've been doing this with passports, for example. But, we're, but this is moving it into a more efficient and a faster age of, 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 this, you know, of applying this concept. And so any, anytime you see data that needs to be trusted, you know, you know it's accurate, you know where it came from, uh, it has immediate application. So I, I added to Heather's you know, travel examples, um, uh, agriculture and supply chain. And that's another case where you actually need to know these things as it travels down the, um, the, the supply chain itself. And, um, and, and agriculture is another one. In some cases, not necessarily at the product level, the way we think of supply chain, but certifications for farms, for example, um, is, a, is a huge one. On, on stage at EIC, um, um, we had Clary representing the, the work that has been happening in, in TANS in New Zealand, talk about the application that, that, that they're using to uh, allow farmers to qualify for uh, loans with a better rate because they can demonstrate certain environmental qualifications of their farms. Um, and so this is, this is not a theoretically, oh, it might be nice. This is, this is a, a practical application that allows the farmers to, to qualify for loans that are otherwise difficult to manage the paperwork for uh, by using verifiable credentials to you know, aggregate and then present that information. So um, before anybody else chimes in, we have a whole bunch of questions in the chat. I want to go through them uh, one by one. So the first one is, can you provide some examples how public sector, government sectors are pursuing verifiable credential deployment? Ideally, most of the public sector are a big fan of centralized identity databases. How do you make a shift in mindset? Uh, I'll take that one. You, you just uh, sorry for talking so much, but you you have to teach them and you have to show them. Um, one of the things is that people that deal with identity systems tend to be really nervous about trying new things, um, and and sometimes it's a lack of imagination. Sometimes it's a fear of changing what's already working. So you have to show the value uh, that they're going to retain, that they're going to gain from from using these technologies. The other thing to do is to help them to understand that this isn't something that they have to like tear down everything they currently have and, and build something new. This is something they can augment their existing system with. It is a new paradigm of interacting with data, but, but it's something they can add and augment. They don't have to throw away the stuff that they've got. In fact, they're going to need the majority of it to, to, to back a, a verifiable credential backed ecosystem anyway. And so you're going to need it directly. You don't have to rip out what you have and, and you, you can add this and, and, and gain those features immediately. Um, and so that, that's a big one. Um, 
so government is interesting because government tends to move rather slow. Uh, the, um, they, but they do bigger things typically. And the European identity effort is, is one of those um, where they, the European Union has gotten together um, to say this is, this is sort of this fundamental thing that we're going to do. Um, and uh, inf government infrastructure projects uh, in the digital realm kind of look like they do in the, in the, in the physical realm. Uh, when, when governments, um, uh, when, when governments, for example, are managing logistics, uh, they are building trains or highways, um, they're not dispatching drums, right? Like that's the, a different kind of a way of, of thinking about this. And so uh, they're good projects and they have value, um, but you have to understand that just because a country builds a train, it doesn't solve all the logistics problems within, within, within a country. And um, you often have to augment, uh, you know, and there's, there's a ton of money to be made in augmenting um, or providing services that are not well met by what the government's doing, but then connect in and join with it. And so that's an awareness uh, to, you know, to watch what's going on in the government sector and then figure out where you can be that is different than what they're doing, but provides and, and, and provides added value that the, that project cannot um, so that you can you can leverage and, uh, and, and, and help your customers or your own immediate solutions, um, you know, solve uh, solve some of those problems. I just want to Does add, anybody Sam said go there, ahead. Yeah, so as an example, one of the discussions we've had with a government that operates a large um, citizen identity database, that this was a concern that they had this concept of decentralization. I think the word decentralization initially made them worried because it almost made them think of some sort of loss of control of data, when in reality, that's not the case. And so when they, when they came around to understanding the concept of making these credentials, these identity um, data points verifiable, uh, through the use of a uh, you know, cryptographic uh, trust source. And then they saw the value in enabling citizens to have better um, control and security over their own private information. And from a political standpoint for a government, that's important. I mean, we've seen governments around the world have massive um, data breaches where databases have been hacked and you know, millions of, of um, uh, citizen documents have been leaked on the, the dark web for sale. Um, so there's a there's a large uh, political incentive to make citizen information safer, um, and so when when talking with governments, I typically go the route of talking about verifiable credentials as opposed to decentralized identity. Although there's obviously a lot of overlap um, and some nuance between the terms, um, but making those those citizen credentials verifiable is a, a big point of value for them. Um, I think just to, to add one point, uh, GDPR has created lots of challenges for data management. Uh, and really nobody wants to, the, the, to, to have to securely store and manage personal data in centralized databases. So, you know, that's a big driver of, uh, of adoption, I think. Um, but- Add up uh, to, to Kyle Robinson's uh, link in the, the channel there. Kyle and his team, they've obviously been doing a lot of work in British Columbia. So Kyle, thank you for posting that. I think British Columbia is a, a, a great use case to look at for this. Um, that's, I was just about to mention that. Um, so um, another, another great question. So many applications just wondering, what does deployment look like in terms of time, resources, and effort? I, I can talk about this. This is something I work with with um, customers you know, when scoping their use case and their deployment. Um, I, so initially, we recommend you know starting starting small uh, with whatever your use case is, identifying who the um, ecosystem participants are, who are the issuers, who are the verifiers, whether you are your own issuer and your own verifier, um, or if you have you know, partners participating in the ecosystem, what your data sources are, how you verify the data. Um, but the technology itself, I would say, is the the easy part of the deployment because um, once you identify what you're going to do with the technology. The technology is already there to get it spun up and going. Um, so, you know, we've we've ranged in terms of timeline from um, design and scoping to actual deployment anywhere from six weeks to to three months. Um, it really just depends on the the scale and the uh, the complexity of the use case. 
So uh, on stage, Clary uh, at EIC, uh, Clary from TANS, um, you know, someone asked about scope and timeline, the same similar question, and, and her answer was that the technology was relatively rapid. It's the coordinating uh, and understanding and, and teaching within, you know, their ecosystem um, that, uh, that, that takes the time. Um, the good news is, is that's really valuable time because it, it helps, um, uh, valuable time spent because it helps people um, come to an awareness of their information problems and the solution that this provides in a really useful way. Often you're solving problems that are there, sometimes that are solved in other ways, but less efficiently. Sometimes you're solving problems that haven't really been able to be solved before. And so you're doing part of the problem of sort of educating people about the problem and what the opportunities actually are as part of the process, because suddenly you're able to solve it kind of um, logistically for the first time. And so the technology uh, is a, is a, is typically a week's thing. It's the it's the coming online with sort of the the mental understanding and and then taking advantage of the technology with business processes. That's that's a little bit of a longer uh, piece there. That's a, that's a great question though. Absolutely, Sam. When we look at Aruba, it took them less than one afternoon to do the technical integration. That was the te and and I think sometimes we look at it like oh that's a heavy technical lift. What we've seen is. The technical integration goes very quickly it's the change management and working through the use case and the roles and the policy that's the the area that we are at and focusing on and so one of the things that we um, excel at is working through the full 360 of the business because using verifiable credentials is more than a technical integration it's bringing together all facets of your business from policy to communications to um, business models that you may offer, um, customer support. And so how can we quickly work in bringing and, and changing entire business process so that's ready to go for the afternoon integration. And it's important to look at this as verifiable credential deployment when it wins and it succeeds it's a team sport in an organization and just like with the panel here today you see someone from various aspects of our own company because we all work so closely together with our counterparts and our customers organizations to go fast and quickly and support them along the way so we have a, a couple of a few more questions. Um, uh, there's a very interesting one from Roy on Didcom, and I know that's one of the interesting things from EIC. But I'm going to hold that first, uh, uh, hold that, and it, we have two questions around KYC. Um, so one of them, is, and you can read them in the chat. Uh, could you talk about the application of VCs to corporate customers as opposed to individuals? I work in KYC, where still the emphasis is on the painstaking collection of data and documents. It can take months to onboard a corporate customer. Surely the future is verifiable credentials slash tokenization. And then the second point is, our second question, I am concerned that in future, verifiable credentials may replace Know Your Customer Video KYC completely if implemented in the right way. So it will be interesting to see the paradigm shift. What are your thoughts? Can I take the second one first? Sure. Um, I don't think that um, that VCs are going to replace KYC or you know video verification of of, of people for remote verification. I think they're going to work in concert. Um, the um, because um, there's still a, a huge need to tie and verify that the holder of a verifiable credential is in fact the person you think they are. Um, and so, and so the need to sort of do a biometric verification or or some sort of tie there is is still going to happen. What what's going to happen is that it's going to make it more efficient in the sense that, it, let's say I'm uh, I'm setting up new I'm moving banks because I moved to a new town and you know my previous one isn't very conveniently located so I'm I'm opening up um, you know stuff at, an, at a new bank. Um, the uh, the verifiable credentials allow the opportunity to to reuse verification that I did in my previous bank, but also even within the same bank, there's often different departments that actually need to run various levels of, of KYC, et cetera, and the ability for um, even the same bank to run a KYC process or a video KYC process, issue a credential as to what they verified and when allows 
me, the new bank customer, to then present that credential to other departments within the same bank so that they don't have to actually repeat the process. So that's, that's good because it's faster. Uh, it's, it's a smoother user experience for me as a customer, but it's also cheaper for the bank because they're typically using an outsourced um, you know, a video KYC process in order to, to accomplish that verification. And so not paying for it to be done two or three times is a significant cost savings as part of that process. Further, financial, financial institutions often have partners that, uh, that, that they would like me to work with I can reuse the same KYC type of information within their partner network for the same advantages. Um, and so I actually don't think that maybe ever KYC or video KYC that for remote verification is actually going to be completely replaced by ver verifiable credentials. It's just going to make them faster and more efficient so that the value of doing a single verification can be spread further in the customer's journey. That's the first, so I hit the second one. Um, uh, does anyone want to take uh, the the corporate um, uh, the corporate credentials, or should I have a go at that? I think that's a good Sam one. <laughs> okay, so that's my lazy response. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Rob, that uh, that collecting verifiable credentials on behalf of corporations will be incredibly valuable. Um, the there's still uh, uh, this process of businesses getting used to the fact that they'll end up with a wallet on behalf of the business. The reason this changes so many things, and, and frankly, there's um, from the technology provider side, there's still kind of, most people have been focusing on providing wallets for individuals because that's a lot of use cases focus on uh, individual credentials. The, um, the, the gap to fill, and we've, we've made huge strides in doing this and in, 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 uh, in, in making it happen, but there's still sort of a lag in the awareness of, of, of how this can apply. You establish a corporate wallet. That's the easy part. Um, and you can collect credentials there. That's a little bit harder in the sense that there typically needs to be management of the corporate wallet. And so the, the missing gap that most people are just now coming uh, to be comfortable with is that the corporate wallet needs to identify which uh, individuals are actually in charge of the corporate wallet. And this will change over time. So it, it, it's, it's insufficient, for example, to, to have Trevor hold all of the credentials re related to verifiable credentials with Indicio, as an example because there, there's, there's more people than just Trevor interacting with those that need to be able to present them. And should Trevor leave the company, there has to be continuity of, of that data um, uh, you know, across uh, uh, for the things. Now, I'm not prophesying anything. We're, we want Trevor forever. Um, but, the, um, but, the, uh, but the gap of the human management of the corporate wallet thing is not yet as well understood as it needs to be. The technology isn't actually that complicated, but helping people sort of understand how this actually works and, 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 and how, to, how to make that happen is, is coming along. Um, so to, to blame uh, the government of, 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 um, of British Columbia again uh, for being a leader in this area, um, they uh, years ago um, were involved in, uh, in sort of a, a public corporate holder of, of, uh, of credentials related to businesses and they, they called this org book. Um, and that model is not a bad one in, in the sense that it allows for verifiable credentials to be used even without organizations coming online as sort of first class citizens, if you will, in, in the VC world. Um, but the real value comes when, uh, when organizations are ready to then accept those credentials and, uh, you know, controlled by officers and, and representatives of the company and then be involved in that K in the corporate KYC process that you're talking about, Rob, so that they can easily present all of the aggregated data together. Um, uh, an early example of that is, again, I, I keep talking about TANS and what they're doing in New Zealand, but that's an early example of the farms collecting their corporate data as a farm, which is sometimes one farmer, but often more than one, um, in order to then present that data to a financial, a financial institution as, as a way to qualify for, for better funding. And so that's coming. You're going to hear a lot more about that, Rob, um, and, and about the applications of that, um, uh, you know, as, as people become more aware of, of the opportunities that are, that are present. Mm -hmm. To add to Sam's point, or, or just perspective from the business side, um, discussing with organizations who are looking to provide KYC for individuals, the main incentive that they typically describe is reducing the, I um, uh, can't think of the word right off the top of my head, but the, the customers that they lose just through not being able to complete the KYC process. That's a, that's a huge amount of customers. In some cases, it can be 60, 70% of people signing up end up giving up just because it takes too long or there's too many steps. 
Um, so the the uh, possibility of having a reusable credential greatly increases the number of people that re that remain. For corporate customers, for businesses getting onboarded, you don't really have that issue um, as much. It's not that businesses give up going through the process. The, the big the big pain point is the opportunity cost of not having that business onboarded to start doing business with or transactions with. Um, that can quickly you know, be up in the seven, eight figures uh, for a business. So the incentive is is huge. Um, and there is definitely uh, interest in, in um, private sector for solutions like that. So for enterprises that are that are looking for this, the technology is there. Um, and we are absolutely interested in, in working with uh, working with you on that. As Sam mentioned, it, it is more of a mindset shift of of uh, you know what players, what what uh, decision makers are involved to to get something like that off the ground. But the, the tech is there. So um, to to move back to one of the questions um, and uh, for a little bit of context. Um, so what was really interesting about attending EIC was so three years ago, decentralized identity got an afternoon. Two years ago, uh, or sort of last year, uh, um, it got a day, and this year it was a stream uh, uh, of continuous um, uh, presentations uh, all through the conference. So for three and a half days, uh, and and I think a huge amount of that was driven by the inexorable, if albeit slow. Uh, process of IDIS, the sort of specification for uh, digital authentication um, to sort of create interoperable digital identities and seamless digital interaction for European Union members. Uh, but that's a um, that's a market, a service market of what, 450 million people. So that's a colossus that's eventually, you know, will come sooner rather than later. And I think a lot of companies were were uh, there to to find out how to make sense of this, um, and of course, one of the on a technical level, uh, um, one of the protocols of uh, that IDIS or the protocol that IDIS uh, specifies is OID uh, uh, for VC. Um, uh, so the uh, you know if uh, uh, is is the, the question is to the panel and one that will. Uh, address ultimately the question is, is OID for VC the, the one protocol to rule them all? Or are we going to see a world where credentials, the basic credentials get wrapped or modded with features that enable them to do things that are much more useful if you're a business? Um, uh, and on that score, um, uh, Sam, why don't you... Uh, uh, take the question from Roy is, is how, how, how is DIDCOM being used and how is DIDCOM going to relate to this OID for VC future in the, in the EU? <clears throat> so there's a lot of focus on OpenID for VC given the choice that the European Union has made. Um, and, uh, and that's not inappropriate. As we mentioned, there's lots of new people coming in and trying to figure stuff out. And that's kind of an ob obvious target because it's selection. Um, and if you want to be compatible with the European digital identity effort, you will need to support the OpenID for VC protocols. Um, there's two, there's one for issuance and one for presentation. Um, the, um, what, what hasn't happened yet is that people are mostly at the beginning phases of, of adopting the, and implementing those protocols um, and, and, and realizing that. And it's doing a lot of good to use a familiar brand name uh, in, the, in the form of OpenID to help people feel comfortable adopting a protocol and getting started with verifiable credentials, and it's doing a good job there. <clears throat> As people begin to uh, begin to adopt it, and they, then they look around and uh, say, like, "Okay, we're here now. Like, what what can we do?" There's there's a natural step that occurs um, that we've already observed happening uh, amongst uh, early adopters um, that will continue. Um, the uh, the ID Union effort um, uh, that is uh, happening in 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 Germany. Um, they um, they recognized that they needed to use that protocol for verifiable credentials, but they, they also recognized that they had business purposes and, and types of customer interaction flows that were not well served by, a, by a, a protocol that can only do verifiable credentials. It does not do anything else. Um, and, it, and, and so uh, they uh, were aware of DIDCOM as a technology and they had used it uh, previously to, to great effect. And so there's a, an effort that's ongoing right now, but, but showing very good results. 
um, called OpenID Didcom that was that was uh, originated within uh, uh, part of ID Union, and they have described the process of bridging the protocols uh, in a way that allows you to start with a with an OpenID interaction and end up not only with the credential that you're that is the the focus of the open id interaction but also with a, a an active and confirmed didcom connection as part of that process which allows you to then have ongoing interaction the way that didcom provides uh, for not only uh, potentially future uses of verifiable credentials such as like reissuance or revocation notification um, but also uh, you know, like communicating with the user uh, you know being able to send the messages across that secure channel or coordinating other sorts of activities that are that are going on and so they're defining that i um, i'm a little bit of an observer there uh, to try and, and help the effort along but that was originated within id union um, and we presented that uh, at, at eic there was a there's a two-hour session on the pre session on the pre-conference day um, that was run by the the diff the decentralized identity foundation and they asked me to present the demo of that working code um, in um, as part of a few minutes of, of their session and there was a lot of positive feedback from that. A lot of people that recognized the ability that they needed to support OpenID, but but also wanted the the features and the flexibility and the and the power that Didcom provides to uh, to go beyond verifiable credentials. And sometimes when I say beyond verifiable credentials, people are like, "What do you mean?" Because in their mind, verifiable credentials are are the, are the actual end goal of what we're doing. And the end goal isn't verifiable credentials. We've talked about the importance of focusing on business cases. The end goal is to improve your business cases, to improve the information flow, reduce costs, speed things up, uh, better privacy, all those things we've talked about. And, and you, you will need verifiable credentials in that process. They're very, very powerful. But then it, the interesting bit is what you do with the verifiable credentials and the extra communication that can happen on top of that. And, and that is what Didcom is, is really well uh, poised to, uh, to take on. So uh, as a little bit of a recap, I don't think it's inappropriate that a lot of, a lot of people are looking at OpenID for VC right now I, um, because of the inclusion in the European protocols, um, but they're going to need to be ready to move beyond verifiable credentials to realize the full value in their business processes. And I think that's where Didcom steps in naturally. And then where I sit um, working on with the business side of companies is they come to the table looking at OID for VC and quickly hit disillusionment because their business needs more than just the exchange of a verifiable credential their vision what they're trying to deliver to their customer exceeds the capability of what oid can offer them and they oftentimes don't fully realize that until they dig into what oid is what oid for vc can do for them and then they say but I'm trying to deliver this rich communications customer experience and they just got me maybe not even a quarter way down the racetrack here. And so they hit a wall. And so what we're saying is there's so much more you can do. One of the ways we can do that is with Didcom, but understanding that OID is not the end goal here. The end goal is delivering a really awesome customer experience or solving a problem in your company it's delivering value from what oid gets you started but it only gets you around the first lap of the race <laughs> and to be clear didcom isn't the end goal either it's simply right. a more capable tool to get you you know down, down to that customer experience Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, there's an, uh, a couple of other questions in the in the chat. I think we we can best respond to them offline. Um, we're nearly at time. I do want to bring up a couple of things that struck me. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the new use cases for verifiable credentials is in managing biometrics and managing biometrics and AI. So um, uh, some of the problems raised were uh, that uh, the biggest risk for employers is employees putting a private company data into public AI. Um, and that requires a new identity management system uh, with, the, with sort of zero trust uh, capacities or m sort of segmentation. And then uh, you also have, uh, you know, uh, AI has reached the point where humans cannot differentiate uh, uh, a deep fake from uh, the real thing. Um, uh, one person made the interesting point that Estonia had long been immune to phishing because it was really difficult to fake Estonian. Um, it's a very peculiar language. Not anymore. 
Um, uh, so um, remote identity proofing is going to need ways to bind biometrics and liveness checks and documents all together and verifiable credentials provide this uh, a way to do this. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes, but uh, any any uh, I, 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 any other thoughts on you know technology trends and uh, and these issues before we close out? Yeah, I'll I'll speak briefly about this and uh, turn over to Heather and Sam. But um, at Identity Week in Amsterdam, there are obviously a lot of uh, biometric hardware providers, biometric software providers. Um, and the discussions with them, them seeing that the combination of verifiable credentials and biometrics is a is a powerful way to um, you know, deliver secure, trustworthy ID verification. Um, being able to bind a credential uh, to a person, to a device, to a workstation, whatever, biometrics can play a large, um, large part in that. Um, but doing it the right way, uh, protecting biometric information, not putting it at risk um, and not making a company liable for, you know, all of their customers or employees' biometric information uh, is also something that they are are trying to to address. And there are ways to do that with the technology that exists today. Well, I think the, the key point to verify, you know, sort of it, people have start, created this massive biometric infrastructure to get around the problems of passwords. Um, verifiable credentials solves the problem of passwords. In addition, uh, or rather, biometrics without verifiable credentials create the problem of actually an insolvable problem. You can't reset a person if their biometric data is stolen. So I think I got a sense that this was a, a real convergence, a, a point of convergence and a, and a, and a, and a real urgent risk. Absolutely. When you're, when you're dealing with the hype, there's always the landing afterward of the reality. And like you say, verifiable credentials comes in and helps solve some of the problems you hit in that reality. And where we see the most interesting deployments of AI biometrics is where they're being very strategic and putting verifiable credentials in these earliest days of deployments. And I think those companies that are doing that now are going to be coming out with some really interesting solutions to what you just described, Trevor, because they're thinking ahead of the AI hype that has everyone all up in a storm. Um, I wish we could go on uh, because there's a few interesting things uh, that we could still say that topics we didn't get to. Uh, but Helen, I think we're at time uh, with barely uh, about a minute left. Uh, so I'm going to hand back over to you. Thank and thank you, you so everybody, much. Thank the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody's questions. Great questions. Great conversation. We will continue this conversation next month. The last Tuesday of every month is when we get together. I would love for you to uh, keep the conversation going on Meetup. Please reach out if you have an idea or would like to present or um, you know want, want to see a certain type of content at these meetings. Please reach out. We'd love to have you present if you have a use case. If you have a deployment that you would like some conversation about, um, please, please don't hesitate hesitate um, to drop me a note. Um, we had a great, great time today. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have uh, other folks lined up to present on um, some great customers and friends of Indicio that are going to come and talk about their uh, implementations. Um, and in the meantime, uh, you have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week, and a great rest of your summer. Um, we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you so much.